Hi, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to keep looking at polynomials. Um, the last couple lectures, we've looked at how we can use the zeros um, of a polynomial to graph them. And then we looked at um, dividing polynomials and kind of how that allows us to confirm possible things are zeros and gain information about points on our graph. And today we're going to um, sort of look at ways to find some of those zeros, right? To, to pick these candidates that we can then use synthetic division in order to prove that those zeros are in fact zeros of this polynomial, right? So we're going to be talking about real zeros of polynomials, okay? And I want to motivate this by taking a look at the factored form of a polynomial, okay? So let's say that p of x is x minus 2 times x minus 3 times x plus 4, okay? And if you work this all out, it comes out to x cubed minus x squared minus 14x plus something. And I want to look at how you would get this constant term. And this constant terms comes from all of the times where we multiply these guys together, right? Our constant term is actually this guy times this guy times this guy, right? Our constant term is negative 2 times negative 3 times 4 or 24, okay? And so the natural question that sort of arises is if we can go this way, is there a way for us to kind of go backwards, right? To look at the coefficients of the constant term or elsewhere and derive what these linear factors should be, right? Because remember, each of these linear factors gives us a zero of our polynomial. And the thing in question that does that is a little something called the rational roots theorem. Okay. theorem, and it goes a little something like this, okay? So say p of x is a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1. You've seen this definition before, right? This is our, just our general definition of our polynomial, okay? where, as per usual, we say that a sub n is not zero. But we also need to say in this particular case that a sub zero is not zero, okay? And our theorem says that then every rational zero of p has the form p over q, okay, where q and p are integers, integers, and we say that p is a factor of the constant term a zero, then Q is a factor of the leading coefficient A sub n, okay? And I just noticed that this guy should technically be one box over, right? So, this is the rational roots theorem, okay? We're not going to prove it. There's a little proof in the book, um, but I don't think that it quite um, would help our understanding of the subjects to go into it. And it is a little bit uh, abstract and strange, so let's just go for an example, okay? So let's find the rational roots. of p of x equals x cubed 
minus 3x plus 2. Okay. And we're looking for all the rational zeros, right? So we can look at our rational roots theorem. And it's going to be all of the factors of our constant term divided by the factors of our leading term. Okay. Well, 2 has two possible factors, 2 and 1. And 1 has one possible factor, 1. Except one note, right, that our theorem talks about integers. So it could be plus or minus, right? So our possible zeros are plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1, right, where these are our factors of 2, divided by plus or minus 1 are factors of 1. This, of course, just comes out to plus or minus 2 and plus or minus 1. Okay, so these are all the possible zeros. And now, in order to verify which ones are zeros or which ones aren't, we need simply plug them in, right? And in, in the future, we'll use syn synthetic division to do that, right, because of our remainder theorem. But in this case, we'll just plug them in by hand, right? P of 1 is 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 plus 2, which equals 0. So that one is good. P of negative 1 is negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1, times negative 3 times negative 1, which is positive 3, plus 2. So this comes out to 3 plus 2 is 5, minus 1 is 4. So that's not a zero. Say p of 2. Well, that's going to be 2 cubed, which is 8, minus 3 times 2, which is negative 6, plus 2. Well, that looks to me like it's going to come out to 4 again. So that's not a zero. What about negative 2? Well, p of negative 2 is going to be negative 2 cubed which is going to be negative 8, minus 3 times negative 2 for a positive 6, plus 2 is 0. Okay, so the rational zeros of this polynomial are plus 1 and minus 2. Okay, and one thing that I want to draw your attention to here really quick is that these zeros are always rational, right? Now, our polynomials could have irrational zeros. This won't find them, right? This only allows us to find all of the rational zeros. Um, and thankfully, many of the problems that we will look at um, only restrict to rational zeros. And we do have some ways to sort of tease out um, the irrational zeros we will get to that. In the meantime, let's do another example. Let's say we want to factor p of x is equal to, I don't know, let's say 2x cubed plus x squared minus 13x plus 6. Okay. First, we want to list all of our possible zeros. Right. These are going to be factors of 6 divided by factors of 2. Okay, so let's write that down. Factors of 6 divided by factors of 2. Well, what are all my possible factors of 6? I have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 6. And my factors of 2 are plus or minus 1, and plus or minus 2, okay? So this gives us a set of possible zeros. All right, let's write that down here. My possible rational zeros are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 6. And then we also get, looks like it's going to be plus or minus 1 half, and plus or minus 3 halves. Okay, 
Now, this is a fairly large set, right? This is 12 possible zeros, but there's infinitely many rational numbers, right? So we've just, you know, cut down our list of possible rational zeros by a lot, okay? So let's just sort of start chugging through these, right? Let's just, you know, say start with one, right? We'll use synthetic division, two, one, negative 13, six. And let's just sort of run through this, okay? We drop down our two, one times two is two, adding down we get a three, three, looks like negative 10, negative 10, and negative four. Okay, so negative four is not zero, so one is not a zero of our polynomial, but if we were wanting to graph this, right, using the sort of techniques that we talked about earlier in the week, now we have a point on our graph, right? Let's try, I don't know, two, right? Let's keep going down the line. Two, one, negative 13, and six. Dropping down our two, we have two. Two times two is four, drop down to five. Five times two is 10, add down to get negative three. Two times negative three is negative six. Six plus negative six is zero, right? This, this is zero, right? So that means the two is a zero, which is great, right? Because what we can do now is we can write P of X like this. It's X minus two times two X squared plus five X minus three, right? Where again, these coefficients come from the output of our synthetic division, but now we have a quadratic here, right? And we know how to factor quadratics, right? We can use whatever method we want, you know, whatever method you prefer to factor your quadratics. See that this is two x minus one times x plus three. But now our polynomial is factored completely, right? We've, we've done what we need to do and if we wanted to graph this polynomial, we have that my zeros are two, one half, and negative three. Let's look at one more before we introduce another topic, okay? Let's say find all of the zeros. And graph. say this guy, let's say x to the fourth minus 5x cubed minus 5x squared plus 23x plus 10. Okay. We have a leading term here of 1, which means that our possible zeros are only ever all of my factors of 10. Okay, so let's write down our list. Gives me a possible zeros of plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus five, and plus or minus 10, okay? So let's give this a shot, right? Let's just start picking some points. Let's start with one, okay? My synthetic division coefficients are one, negative five, negative five, 23, and 10, okay? One, one times one is one, we get negative four. Four times negative one is negative four. Adding down, that's negative nine, negative nine. 23 plus negative nine is 14. One times 14 is 14 and we have an output of 24. So one is not a zero, but P of one is equal to 24. Let's try two. All right, we'll just sort of work our way up the list. So we have one, negative five, negative five, 23 and 10. Draw a line, draw this line. Looks like we have one, one times two, is two, negative three, negative six, negative 11. 
negative 11 times 2 is negative 22. Looks like we get 1. 1 times 2 is 2, and 12. So once again, unfortunately, not a 0, right? But we do have another point on our graph. So let's keep going up. Let's try 5. 1, negative 5, negative 5, 23, and 10. 1, 1 times 5 is 5, so we get 0, 0, negative 5. Negative 5 times 5 is negative 23, sorry, is negative 25. Adding straight down, we have negative 2, negative 2 times 5 is negative 10, and 0. Okay, so what have we done now, right? Now we've, we, we can write P of X as x minus 5 times x cubed minus 5x minus 2, or plus 2, sorry. So what does this mean, right? If something is a factor of this, right, and this is a factor of p of x, well, then that allows us to cross off a whole bunch of our possible solutions, right? We know 1 isn't a solution, or, or positive 1 isn't, right? We know positive 2 isn't. But we now also know, since my possible factors of this guy are only plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2, right? Now we know that we don't even need to check 10 or negative 5, because those just simply couldn't be possible zeros, right? We, we've restricted our list quite a bit, right? Now it's just plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. But we already know that plus 1 and plus 2 don't work, so it's actually just minus 1 and minus 2, okay? Before we keep going, I did notice that when I changed that to a positive, that was not correct. It's clearly a negative 2 right there. But so let's try out this negative 2 in some synthetic division. So we have negative 2. The coefficients of our um, cubic function are going to be 1, 0, negative 5, and negative 2. And let's see what we get here. We have, we drop down a 1, negative 2, negative 2. Looks like that's positive 4 for a negative 1, a positive 2, and a 0, okay? So now we can write p of x again as an even more reduced form. We have x minus 5 from our original one. We just factored out an x plus 2. And we're left with x squared minus 2x minus 1, okay? Looking at that right off the top of my head, I can't find anything that factors, okay? So for tearing apart this guy, well, we can just use the quadratic formula, right? It's going to be 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times negative 1 times a positive 1, all over 2, right? Which like the, that's going to be 2 plus or minus the square root of 8 over 2, or 1 plus or minus the square root of 2, okay? So now this collects all of our zeros. My zeros of p. Well, we're going to have our two rational ones, 5 and negative 2. And then we're going to have 1 plus the square root of 2 and 1 minus the square root of 2, right? Both of these are clearly irrational, right? which is why they did not show up on our possible rational roots. So I guess I should add an addendum there that these are our possible rational roots of our polynomial. We do have a fair number of um, possible points that we know the value of. Um, so for part B, graphing P of X, I'm going to have you do this home. Graphing polynomials is um, 
Well, it's rather important to this course, um, so go ahead and use this time to practice that. So one of the things that tends to happen when we're doing these sorts of processes, right, when we're trying to find the rational roots of these polynomials, is we end up with these sort of massive lists of possible um, rational roots. And, well, yes, I did say earlier that we should rejoice, right, because we cut down an infinite list to a finite list. That's true. Um, but, you know, we sort of, we want to look for a better possible um, situation, right? Is there a way that we can, you know, knowingly restrict these, right? Is there a way that we could find an upper or a lower bound for our zeros, okay? There is a very, very nice theorem that we will um, introduce to sort of uh, look at how we can find the upper and lower bounds for zeros, but let's define first what we mean by upper and lower bound, okay? So we say B is an upper bound, and A is a lower bound for the zeros of a polynomial if every real zero C satisfies A is less than or equal to C is less than or equal to B. And what this is saying, right, I'll, I'll draw you a little picture, okay. Say our polynomial has some number of zeros, okay. And I'll call them C1, C2, C3, and C4. What an upper or lower bound is, is it's essentially giving us a, a restricted interval for where we can look, right? We say A is a lower bound there, and maybe B is an upper bound there. What that means is that all of the zeros of my polynomial are somewhere in here, right? What's important to note, right, is, is these numbers are not unique, right? If we had, you know, say some number up here, call it D, well, D is greater than B. So clearly, you know, this, this sort of like amended interval here also makes D an upper bound, okay? And if that's still a little bit confusing, I think it will sort of sort itself out um, as we look at the upper and lower bound theorem, okay? Upper and lower bound theorem. I'm actually going to put this on a new page because I don't think we quite have enough room to keep it on that one. So here's what it says, okay? First, we're going to say let P be a polynomial with real coefficients. Perfect. And it sort of comes in two parts, okay? It's the, the first part says, if we divide P of X by X minus B, where B is greater than zero, we do this using synthetic division. And if the row that contains the quotient and remainder, quotient and remainder has no negative entry. Well, then B is an upper bound 
for the real zeros of p, right? And, and, and so the really nice thing about this, right, is that this accounts for even our irrational zeros, right? We can sort of hone in and, and look for, okay, well, there must be an irrational zero somewhere in here. I just don't know what, what it is, right? Um, let's look at the second part of this, okay? It says if we divide p of x by x minus a, where a is negative, once again using synthetic division, okay? And if the bottom row right the, the the bottom row after doing synthetic division right the same row that this guy is talking about if you were to you know set up your little synthetic division table you have b here you know you have all of your entries here you end up with some numbers here and some numbers here Right, this, this bottom row is this guy right here, okay? So if that bottom row has entries that alternate non-positive and non-negative, well then A, the lower bound for the real zeros of p. Okay, so we have a sort of matching um, statement that gives us a lower bound for our zeros. Okay, so let's do an example of this because. I know when I saw that the first time, I was a little bit confused about how I would go about using this, okay? So let's show that all the zeros of say p of x is equal to x to the fourth minus three x squared plus two x minus five. Let's say that all of those are between negative three and positive two, okay? So again, we're seeking to show that, you know, two is an upper bound and three is a lower bound. So let's start with two. We wanna use our synthetic division. Coefficients are one, zero, negative three, two, and negative five. Draw a line draw the second line, and let's do our synthetic division. One, one times two is two, adding straight down. Two times two is four, adding those together I get positive one. One times two is, well, once again, two, adding down for four. Two times four is eight for an output of three, right? And notice that all of these are non-negative. So what that means is that two is an upper bound for our zeros, okay? Now let's consider negative three. It's again one, zero, negative three, two, negative five. Okay. So, when we do the synthetic division, we have one, negative three, negative three, looks like nine, positive six, negative 18, adding straight down to get negative 16. Three times 16 is 48, and those negatives cancel. Adding straight down, we get 43. But if we notice, these alternate in sign. right? 
so 3 is a lower bound as required. Okay, I have two more examples for you. One very much like the one we just did. Okay, but it's going to show us a little bit more about this whole non positive, non negative thing, which I know is a little bit, uh, at least it, it feels a little bit pedantic. Okay, so let's say p of x is x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 3x squared plus 7x minus 5. Okay. And let's show that all the zeros of P are greater than or equal to, which I suppose there's a much shorter way to write that, but I guess I've already written it, a greater than or equal to negative 4, right? So we're attempting to show that 4 is a lower bound. So, we would divide p by negative 4 using synthetic division. My coefficients are 1, 4, 3, 7, and negative 5. And then it's going to look to me like we're going to get 1. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4, adding straight down is 0. 0 times negative 4 is 0. We get 3. 3 times negative 4 is going to be negative 12. Adding straight down, we get negative 5. 5 times 4 is 20. Adding straight down, we get 15. And this is one of the reasons that it's written alternating non-positive and non-negative, right? Because, well, 0 is not positive, and 0 is also not negative, right? So zero is sort of like a wild card in these, right? Zero counts for whatever you want, since it's both non-positive and non-negative. So this goes non-negative, wild card, non-negative, non-positive, non-negative, okay? So this is alternating, which is awesome, because that means negative four is a lower bound for the zeros of p, right, of p of x, right? So what that would mean, right, is, is, is if you were looking for the zeros, right, if you were trying to factor it, well, you wouldn't need to check negative 5, right, because that's less than negative 4, okay? One last example for you that's going to kind of put together everything we've done, and that is this, okay? We want to factor the following polynomial. 2x to the fifth plus 5x to the fourth minus 8x cubed minus 14x squared plus 6x plus 9. Very, very large polynomial, right? Um, but we can still go through it, okay? Our possible zeros of this polynomial, or possible rational zeros, rather, are our factors of 9 divided by our factors of 2. Okay. Writing those out, they're 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 3, 9 halves, and 9. So let's work this through, right? Let's just pick a possible 0 and run our calculations. Okay, let's start with 1 half. See if we can get anything there. 2, 5, negative 8, negative 14, 6, and 9. And we run through our synthetic division. 2, adding down we get 1, 6, looks to me like we have 3, negative 5, so now we have negative 5 halves, negative 14 is negative 28 halves, minus 5 halves is negative 33 halves, okay, 
1 half times this is negative 33 fourths. And the nice thing about this is this is going to add to 9 fourths, or negative 9 fourths. Multiplying by 1 half, we have negative 9 eighths, which is adding down to 63 over 8, which is definitively not 0. Okay. It's unfortunate, but I don't know. Let's try 1. Let's see if we get anywhere with that, right? Just keep working down our list. We have 2. 5, negative 8, negative 14, 6, and 9. And let's do our division. We drop down our 2. 1 times 2 is 2. Looks like we have 7, 7, negative 1, negative 1, negative 15, negative 15. But that comes out to negative 9, and 9 plus negative 9 is 0. Okay, so p of 1 equals 0. This is great. Which means that that's a factor. So we can rewrite p of x. x minus 1 times 2x to the 4th plus 7x cubed minus x squared minus 15x minus 9. And unfortunately, we have our same list of possible zeros because we still have a 9 and a 2. So let's just keep working up our list, okay? Let's try positive 3 halves. Personally, I will often, not all the time, but often work through my positive entries first just because I try to avoid working with negative numbers when possible. Okay. So writing down our new coefficients, we have 2, 7, negative 1, negative 15, and negative 9, right? That's one of the nice things about being able to reduce our polynomial just a bit is it makes the synthetic division go faster, right? So let's run through this, right? Looks like we've got 2. 2 times 3 halves is 3. 3 plus 7 is 10. 10 times 3 halves is 15. Adding straight down, we get 14. Multiplying, we get 21. Adding straight down, we get 6. Multiplying, we have 9. And we have 0. Okay. And there's two things to notice here. One, we have that p, equals th p of 3 halves equals 0. So we found one of our zeros. But also, note that each of these is positive. Right? So that means x equals 3 half is an upper bound for our zeros, which means we don't need to check positive 3. We don't need to check 9 halves. We don't even need to check 9. Right? We don't need to check any of that. We've just reduced our thing. Okay? So what does our polynomial become now? We can write this like this. P of x is x minus 1 times x minus 3 halves, which we just got. Right. And then grabbing our coefficients 2, 10, 14, and 6. 2x squared, 2x cubed, plus 10x squared plus 14x plus 6, okay? But here's what I want you to notice, right? Each of these has a factor of 2 in it, right? So what I can do is I can pull that factor of 2 out, right? And then I can multiply it into this one. And what that's going to leave me with is that same x minus 1 times 2x minus 3 times x cubed plus 5x squared plus 14x, plus 3, okay? And now this is really nice, right? Because we have a couple of possible zeros for this guy, right? Our possible zeros are our factors as follows. Our factors of 3 divided by our factors of 1, okay? 
But we already know that 3 halves is an upper bound. So in fact, we don't need to check positive 3. We need only check negative 3. So let's grab some factors and start trying, right? Let's, uh, I don't know, let, let's try 1 again, right? One of the things to notice, right, is this rational roots test, this doesn't account for multiplicity, right? So 1 could be a 0 multiple times. So let's try it, right? The coefficients are 1, 5, 14, and 3. And I'm not sure how I missed this, but I did not divide 14 by 2, so that should be a 7. Okay. So let's do our synthetic division, right? We have 1, 1, 6, 6, it's like 13, 13, and 16. So nope, that one is unfortunately not a zero. So let's try negative one, right? Because we don't need to try positive three. What happens when we plug negative one? We have one, five, seven, and three are our, po are our coefficients. One, negative one, four, negative four, three, negative three, zero. Would you look at that? We have a factor, okay? So let's write this out again. So we have x minus 1, 2x minus 3, x plus 1, and then we're left with what? x squared plus 4x plus 3. Perfect. But as we've seen before, this is a quadratic, right? So we can factor that using our normal means. This is x minus 1, 2x minus 3. We copy, copy, copy. And this looks like it's going to factor into x plus 1 and x plus 3. Okay. Or concatenating that just a little bit, we have x plus 1 is the multiplicity 2, 0, plus x plus 3. And now our polynomial, our you know, seemingly very ugly and difficult to graph or factor or really do anything with polynomial has been reduced to a series of linear terms. Now here's my challenge to you. Go ahead and graph that guy. Now that you have your polynomial written as a bunch of linear terms, you can graph it using the methods that we have discussed in previous sections.